I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about the Declaration of Helsinki. But before I do so, I would like just to say a few words about the World Medical Association. The World Medical Association is the roof organization of currently 102 national medical associations. And since 1947, when it was founded, um, it understands itself as the platform for developing a common understanding and common guidelines on medical deontology, on the professional code of ethics. Uh, since that time, since 1947, um, and this is in the aftermath of, the, of World War II and certainly of what happened in my own country, in Germany, the abuse of research, the World Medical Association has a focus on developing ethical guidelines for physicians. Certainly we're also looking to other questions around medicine, especially the um, social questions uh, on the environment in which we do medicine. And, and that extends um, lately also into the questions of social determinants of health we are very much developed and engaged in. In 1964, the Declaration of Helsinki was uh, first published, and since then the Declaration has become, I would say, a very important document for guiding physicians, uh, developing ethical principles for medical research in involving humans. Uh, the aim of that document um, has developed over time um, quite considerably and while it was in the beginning the idea that there should be an ethical foundation in order to facilitate medical research involving humans, it shifted more and more um, with a certain emphasis on protecting study subjects. Um, Expe uh, protecting study subjects against dangerous experiments, uh, but also against exploitation. Now, as we will find, there's always <coughs> some risk and always some danger with doing experiments in medicine, but of course, it is to avoid any danger that can be avoided that this declaration is about. And certainly to show limits of danger in experiments. What are the mechanisms of the declaration that it uses? Um, certainly from the beginning the question was what is ethically correct and acceptable and what is methodologically correct because we believe that only sound methodology should be used when doing experiments <coughs> in humans. And for the first time in an international document the informed consent was demanded as a basis for taking persons into experiment. Um, there is a misunderstanding about what is called the so-called Nuremberg Codex, which is very often quoted as being the first international document um, in, in mentioning the informed consent. That is not correct. The Nuremberg Codex was a document crafted by a U.S. military tribunal sentencing uh, the doctors involved in concentration camp experiment in 1946 to 1947. It has not been, it never was, an international document. Actually, it never has been used. It never has been used by any administration. It never has been adopted by anybody, although it certainly was a very good document for that time. It is now being discussed widely with historians since the last 20 years, but actually, in the time after 1947, 1947 it merely has got forgotten, and, and it was not referenced and has not been quoted at that time. The Declaration of Helsinki further um, gives advices and permissions or requires advice and permission by ethics committees. Uh, you may think this is a very natural concept and that always has been there. It has not been there. Uh, in this, on the international stage, it first has been demanded for in 1974 in the so-called Tokyo revision of the Declaration of Helsinki. It is actually a pretty new concept. And finally, the obligation to make public and that is as well to have studies registered in a publicly available register so that people know which experiments in humans are being currently done or have been done, but also to have the results published because we believe that it is an ethical imperative to make the information, the knowledge accessible about studies um, because otherwise there may be the danger that studies are being repeated um, in a superfluous way and that may again expose people to danger which is absolutely unnecessary. 
We started with that work in 1954 uh, with the first resolution on experiments with humans. There was a draft code in 1961, and I said already in 1964, so now 49 years ago, uh, the Declaration of Helsinki has been adopted. Since then, it is certainly a key document on research being done in humans. In 1975, the Ethics Committees appeared in that document, as I said. And in 1996, we had a, doc a first discussion about the use of placebos, and at that time, the World Medical Association took a very clear stance against the use of placebos in research. That was confirmed in 2000 in a very politically and emotionally hated debate, heated debate, um, where also questions of post-trial access for the first time came to the surface, and, and very much the discussion about vulnerable population started uh, or entered the document at, at that time. Unfortunately, what we found out was that the um, rules for the placebo use were too strict and it had to be corrected by a note of clarification which was issued in 2004 and there also was a second note on clarification concerning the post-trial access which had produced some confusion uh, within the document in 2004. Uh, both of that was fixed in the 2008 version of Seoul, where we again did a formal opening towards the use of placebos in research, because what we found was that there are scientific reasons to use placebos in clinical research uh, under very limited and described circumstances that have to be justified um, in order to, to be permissible there. Now, what is the importance of the Declaration of Helsinki? I think it's the most quoted um, ethical guideline on, on doing research. It has been referenced by um, many national and, and international documents, for instance, the European Union Good Clinical Practice Guideline. Um, it has been used by, it's been used by the European Medicines Agencies, the Federal Drug Administration withdrawal after the Edinburgh version of 2000 because of the uh, very restrictive uh, rules on placebos. Um, so far they have not come back, although they are part of our discussion of the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, but there are other parts in the Declaration of Helsinki uh, which probably do not appeal to a government institution and therefore it will be difficult um, to, to have the FDA back there. Um, we will later on hear about the SEOMS um, guidelines for research, which are a very detailed document and guidance for researchers. And there is a strong interconnection between the Declaration of Helsinki and the SEOMS guidelines, vice versa in both directions. Uh, WHO has been quoting the Declaration of Helsinki and has been using it for, for reference. The uh, International Conference for Harmonization, which is an industry government um, conference and gives technical guidelines, is referring to the Declaration of Helsinki. And then there are numerous national laws and regulations, uh, many of them binding to physicians, which refer, refer to the Declaration of Helsinki. In my own country, it is in the Binding Professional Code. In Sweden, for instance, it's part of the law on testing new drugs, uh, so physicians have to obey to the Declaration of Helsinki. Now, Jim Appleyard already uh, said quite clearly, and, and that is an absolute true statement, it is a living document. Um, it addresses questions of research, ethics of research, and as we all know, research is changing constantly, and the requirements of research are changing constantly. Now, that does not mean that we um, want to go with the zeitgeist or want to be modern with the document. That's absolutely not on our horizon. But of course, what we have to be asking as ourselves all the time is, is that document still relevant for research? Does it fit into our research environment? Um, and do our principles still stand? Uh, and can they be followed? Especially with the declaration of 2008, where we opened for the placebo use again, there has been criticism to the declaration of Helsinki, uh, especially from Latin America, um, who, where there is a, a large group of physicians who believe that placebos should not be used in clinical research. Um, it has triggered a, a lot of attention within the World Medical Association when we decided on the new version in 2008, and it has been a concern since then. 
We needed clearer words on post-study access to care. Um, that certainly is important because experiments are now being done in many countries around the world uh, which are certainly having not a, a proper healthcare system. And the question is what happens to people after the research has been done. We certainly don't want um, any group of patients to be used as, let me say quite frankly, guinea pigs. Um, they have to be in, in, in themselves and that also means that there has to be an idea of what happens with the treatment and with the care of those persons after the study has been concluded. We wanted to have a better protection of vulnerable groups and there has been a long discussion about whether we should name individual groups. Um, Jim has himself been a very strong proponent, always talking with us about the protection of children, the research being done in children, which is a very important development during the past 20 years. But we have a lot of other groups where we have to look at um, whether those are this fortunate groups uh, of poor populations, illiterate patients, whether those are, for instance, pregnant women, or groups f that are vulnerable for any other reason. Um, and we found that it is very difficult to find um, an enumeration of those, of those groups. And finally, the advice was that we heard is um, not to name a specific group, but to make provisions for vulnerable groups in general. And for those, I think we have dealt with the questions of what are we putting in as safeguards for research in vulnerable groups. And I think we have now made very strong recommendations for protecting vulnerable groups, as you will be able to find out in the proposed draft, which is attached as the last part uh, in the handout that I have been giving to you. Another interesting question that came up, um, very much to my surprise, was that, that many of the experts we have consulted during the process um, of renewing the declaration told us, why are you writing this only for physicians? The declaration is addressed to physicians um, verbatim, and the question is, why aren't you doing this for, for everybody? Now, uh, the answer is very simple, um, because we are a strongly democratically rooted organization. We believe in a mandate um, and we believe that we have a mandate to speak for physicians, but we don't have a mandate to speak for other health professionals. We don't have a mandate to speak for dentists, for nurses, for others who are doing research. Um, yet what we do is we invite others to read our document and maybe to adopt it themselves. What we do is we address other groups when we believe it has something to do with the research we are doing. So what we do in the Declaration of Helsinki, although we say we speak only for physicians and we only can address physicians, yes, we do for instance address um, governments, yes, we do for instance address editors of journals whom we believe that they should have a look into the Declaration of Helsinki and that they should not publish material that is not in conformity with the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, we have discussed quite extensively and, and uh, worked about the consent and research with identifiable data and human samples. This is something that is of growing importance because the growing number of biobanks and the question of secondary use of samples which are in biobanks. And likewise, this also um, accounts for, for the question of use of health data because uh, we are doing already and in the future probably more doing virtual experiments just with health data without having real subjects or specimens, material specimens in place. And of course, we want to keep it a living document and by doing this discussion about the Declaration of Helsinki, we would like to demonstrate the ownership for the document. So, in 2008 already, um, with, with the adoption of the Seoul version, the Council of the World Medical Association asked us um, to look into the placebo question again, because, as I said, there was criticism from the beginning. Um, and they asked us to monitor the use of placebos in research. So we did two hearings, uh, both in Latin America, about the use of placebos, although with international attendance from experts on placebo research and placebo use. We invited as well those who have published positively about the use of placebos as those who have voiced criticism to that. Um, with these two hearings, there were two things very clear for us. Number one was, yes, it was necessary that we did an opening to use placebos in research because there is a necessity 
um, a defined necessity for using placebos as control groups in very circumstances, very defined circumstances, um, and, and under uh, very strict observations. But there has to be this opening for using placebos in research. But it, told, it showed us also the discussion which we had in 2010 and 2011 that there was a need um, to, to go into the revision process again and to think about what we can improve in the Declaration of Helsinki uh, during the next years. So Council asked us to prepare another round of consultations with experts who had published on, on the Declaration of Helsinki and interested groups. And so we did, um, uh, starting after, after we got this uh, commission from the General Assembly in Montevideo in October 2011. Um, we started last year with a satellite conference um, on the International Bioethics Conference in Rotterdam. We had a second meeting um, in Cape Town in December last year, uh, another one in January and February this year in, uh, in uh, uh, Japan. And uh, finally we were able to present a draft um, to the Council of the World Medical Association and the Council of the World Medical Association finally decided that this draft was good enough um, to be released for public consultation. Now that doesn't mean that the World Medical Association believes that this is the final version of a new declaration. It is a version that they found is good enough to have it discussed publicly and um, that is what we now have out there. So, what will you find in the uh, new draft for the Declaration of Helsinki? And as I said, it is with your documents I hand it out and you will find it also on our website in an annotated version. Um, we took up the idea of some of the speakers in, in our expert hearings and conferences that the document could be reorganized without changing the content itself uh, in order to achieve a better readability. And so we did. So what you find is you will find a completely new reorganized document, um, although it stays with the principles and the text for most of it that it had before. However, we had to change a few specific items in the declaration. We thought that it was necessary to put in a higher protection for vulnerable groups. And I think you will see we have balanced nicely some questions um, of benefits and beneficence in that, in that document. Um, we have put in a higher protection for participants um, by including the issue of compensation or I would call it material protection of study subjects. Now that is already given in many countries of this world but there are a lot of other countries in this world where this is not granted and we believe that everybody who is subjected to medical research should be protected properly so that if any damage happens uh, that that person is being compensated for that damage completely. Whether that is being done by insurance or by a public fund or whatever way um, is something that has to be found in, in a country and specific for that country, but we think there have to be rules in place that make sure that everybody who enters in, into an experiment is protected materially uh, so that if something happens uh, he, shouldn't have, he shouldn't take a second damage from that. We have more specific requirements for post-study arrangements, although many of us thought that, that this was very clear in the 2008 version. It appeared that people did not understand this completely, that of course when you are doing an experiment you have to explain what the post-study arrangements are as well to the ethics committee or internal review board as to the patients entering the study or the persons entering the study so that they exactly know what happens to them after the study. So they can take this also into consideration whether they want to enter a study or not. And finally we have a more systematic approach to the use of placebos and not only placebos but any other comparator because we thought that has to be included when you use a second best solution instead of having the best available therapy uh, as a comparator. As I said, um, you will find all those changes in detail in the paper I have given to you and if you look it up on our website you also will find um, that we have there an annotated version which explains you how we have moved around the text and, and what we have inserted and what we have deleted. So we are going now um, to have 
a collection of, of input from a public consultation which is on our website until June 15th. We will meet for another conference um, with the, the stakeholder groups, the uh, organizations that are using the Declaration of Helsinki, uh, for instance like CUMS, like WHO, uh, who will be invited to join us for this conference and of course our members in order to uh, decide on a final draft that then will go um, hopefully uh, to the General Assembly in Brazil in October this year. Now, our imperative is not to finish this this year. If we find that there are problems which we still have to work on, we will take another year and we will do it in 2014. Um, our imperative is the quality and, and not the timeline. That is very important. Finally, um, how can you uh, participate in, in that discussion? Um, as I said, there is a uh, documentation on our website, uh, www.wma.net, and you are invited to uh, uh, submit comments as an individual or as an organization, both is possible via email um, to our address, doh at wma.net, not later than June 15th. And um, we welcome every comment, every idea, whether that is support or criticism. Uh, we believe that it is very important to hear all the voices. And in the past, I can tell you over the years, I have been working with the Declaration of Helsinki now for nearly two decades. It has been a great learning exper experience for all of us. And I think we have considerably improved the document over time. And uh, I am very convinced it will stay a cornerstone document for research uh, with humans in this world. Thank you very much.